to the next session. Uh, I asked five architects from the US and Canada and Brazil to, uh, we did a deep search to find some really interesting uh, and innovative projects. And um, so here's the thing, five architects, five minutes, minutes each. Um, Brian Phillips, wait, please, um, Brian, Anna, Joanna, Misha, uh, please introduce yourself. We have received one recording from the architect in LA that is uh, 6.30 a.m. In, in LA right now. So um, Brian, let's start with you. Please introduce yourself. And yeah, that's going to be amazing. So Brian, take it from here. Great. Um, do you want me to go right into my presentation or am I just introducing myself? Whatever you feel like it. Okay. Introduce yourself and then open your presentation. Okay, great. Um, well, it's great to be here. Um, I'm coming to you from Philadelphia in the US and um, uh, my name is Brian Phillips. I'm principal at a firm called ISA. Um, I'm also an adjunct faculty member at the University of Pennsylvania in the architecture department. And I think um, our practice uh, has um, really been focused, I, certainly at first, in our home city of Philadelphia. And I think this idea of kind of sort of learning from the local condition has been an important part of our uh, of our of our of our journey. And I just wanted to um, start by kind of pointing out. I think you know, in the last couple of years, we've all been reminded of how important housing is, not only within the category of architecture, but within the category of society and that and that housing in particular, I think, sits at the nexus of many of the social, political and economic uh, conversations that we're we're having at the moment um, and just sort of appreciating this initiative to talk more about smart density. I think from the standpoint of designers and planners and architects, this seems to be uh, a really important issue for us to to grapple with. Um, so just, I don't, uh, uh, just to kind of share a little bit about this laboratory within which we work, um, what's kind of cool about Philadelphia is I think in many ways, certainly by U.S. standards, there is a kind of built-in smart density. It's a city that's, uh, over 300 years old, um, was built sort of in the image of London of this sort of row house, uh, kind of fabric, um, usually not more than 30 or 40 feet tall. Um, and often can hit quite a high density um, with, you know, 100 units per acre just sort of built into to this sort of tiny lot approach. Um, just a couple of statistics. Philadelphia has upwards of 400,000 row houses to city of one and a half million people. Mm -hmm. So chances are you might live in a row house, um, which is kind of interesting. And, and frankly, the, the wealth gap is also smoothed a little bit by the physical form of the city, meaning... Um, someone with more means may have a couple extra feet of width in their row house. Uh, and there is a kind of sort of living together within this sort of what I would call, uh, uh, you know, middle scale typology. Um, and, and the result is a really intimate sense of house, sidewalk, street, and this sort of community building. Um, and uh, it's really kind of delightful to scout the city and see all of these different eras constructed of different styles and materials, but all embracing the street um, and this idea of neighborhood in a very direct way. Um, so one of the things, we actually just recently wrote a paper on this idea of low rise high density, which I think is really right in the crosshairs of this of this talk. Um, and uh, something that we've, you know, particularly in the US where there's a lot of single family house construction and a lot of high rise construction, and mid-rise construction driven by elevators, we think there's really this untilled land here in this sort of single stair walk-up zone, uh, something we're very focused on. And I think um, is a place where attainable and affordable housing can be found much more naturally. Uh, so just quickly, I was asked to highlight this case study. Um, it's called Excess House. Uh, we do lots of buildings that operate within this kind of sort of single, single stair walk-up zone. I think this one, while it's certainly not a row house, it's maybe sort of a super row house. It's seven units on an 11 foot wide lot. Um, we've been very interested lately in uncovering uh, what we think of as leftover sites, as sites that after developers go through and do the easy stuff, there's often some remainders and they often sell for under market because nobody knows what to do with them. And I think this is a great example of one where a highway was cut through the neighborhood um, in the middle of the 20th century. 
and left indiscriminately a series of very small, thin, sort of unusable parcels. And so that's the that's the backstory of this lot. Um, one of the things that we're often doing, and I think all architects are when you're confronted with a lot that might be a little odd or small, is how do you expand its scale in clever ways? And so I think we did that both in plan and section. In section, we were interested in this idea of the mezzanine, which allows a unit to stack, depending on the code you're using, one third or half of the area of the floor below within the single story of the unit. So you can see here, um, just looking at this kind of progression, we added a bi-level top and occupied the basement. We converted a couple of floors into mezzanines, which add area and volume, which is kind of delightful to live in. And then we were also allowed to project three feet all over the sidewalk. So when we're all said and done, we get a section that while it starts at 11 feet wide, had both vertical volume and plan uh, expansion through terraces and widened rooms. And so here, just diagrammatically, you can see in plan, single stair building right in the middle, all the units either come off of the street directly at the ground. Again, this idea of sort of preserving walkability and kind of pedestrian life. And then upper units all coming directly off the stair. <clears throat> and then you can see this mezzanine unit on the right that's highlighted. You can see you can go up a stair to a sleeping loft above. Being super respectful of my five minutes, I am close. Uh, so I just wanted to show you guys some images. You get a sense of what the result is. I think um, that volume space and mezzanine really expands the tight constraints of the of the area. Um, you can see that upper right, um, that person sort of walking out into the bay window area. So, th so she's actually right at the line between the 11 feet and then the additional three feet. So you really get the sense of how that space is expanded and I think how the volume works. Um, the galley kitchen, you open your front door, you walk in, the kitchen's a hallway out to the wider space. So again, just really economical use of uh, the way the program interacts with this small scale. Um, here's a kind of cutaway section of seeing that single stair organization in the middle with the units um, coming off of it. And you can also get a sense of the mezzanine spaces there and the kind of double stacks. Um, single stair buildings, you know, uh, the stair is used a lot to get up and down. So this idea of having a cup, there's actually a couple of benches and social spaces in the stair and also just thinking about the design and coloration as, you know, something that um, kind of reminds people uh, of kind of the moment they're in. And <clears throat> I'll just wrap here with a couple of exterior images. Um, the building's 11 feet deep, that narrow side, but 90 feet long. So it does have this kind of interesting scale in the city. Um, you can see it here facing the highway. I guess here's my last image. You can kind of see the the highway that cut the lot, trimmed the lot out that created this thin parcel. Um, and that's that's a wrap. That's my that's my piece. Brian, thank you very, very much. Uh, it's fantastic. I'm <laughs> I'm looking at these photos and, and it reminds me of, of how much I miss traveling and, and it's, it's amazing. And my team here behind me just said, oh, we need more of this in Toronto. So thank you very much for that. Brian, please stick for sure. the Q&A. Um, Anna and Isabella, I believe uh, Anna Rollim and Isabella tried it. Please, um, you are next. Uh, Isabella, hi, how are you? Can you... Yes, yes, sir. Sure. Um, first, thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. I am Isabella Trindade, and I'd like to thank you and all the organizers for this uh, meeting and the opportunity to be here. I share my, um, I share the PowerPoint we have. Um, Hello, my name is Ana Rolin, and I'm here with Isabella Trindade uh, to present the project Lane Way of Living, Small Villages in the Heart of Toronto's Urban Fabric, the third prize winner of the international competition Toronto Affordable Housing Challenge that happened earlier this year. Briefly introducing ourselves, we are architects and educators originally from Brazil. In 2011, we founded the studio Colletivo Arti Architecture and Interiors, and since then, we have worked on several interior design 
and architectural projects, both in Brazil and overseas, including competitions, are a very important part of our practice. This is a project we are going to focus on today. The main question behind the Lane Way of Living project was how do you reconcile a tackling the housing crisis in Toronto with the realities of its urban fabric and historical legacy? As an acupuncture process, we propose to think big by acting small. A total of 2,433 public laneways are available in Toronto, which represents an opportunity to use land and existing infrastructure more efficiently while mitigating urban sprawl and contributing to environmental sustainability. Um, laneways are viable locations for a compact typology known as the laneway suite, a housing unit located within residential uh, lots, detached from the main house and accessible from the laneway. Our testing site, uh, for our testing site, we chose the district of Little Italy, where population density is higher than the average in Toronto. Just zooming in there really quickly. Uh, that's the area. We act on two scales, the lot and the laneway itself. By putting these two together, we think uh, we could improve interaction amongst uh, inhabitants and the overall vibrancy in the neighborhood, and if replicated, the city as a whole. This is, this is the specific location we implemented our design at. Uh, the redesign of the laneway departs from the non-alignment of bordering lots. Um, so the new transversal lines we created would help to reduce the long and narrow proportion of the laneway, marking uh, the building entry, um, both the new laneway suite entries and the existing building uh, that can be accessed from the backyard. The design also defines landscaped areas in the 1.5 meter front setback and in between lots. So the 58 square meter uh, base unit is configured as follows. I have private, have public ground floor with uh, the entry to the laneway suite and a covered public patio, also trash enclosure. Uh, in the basement, you have a flexible space for a bedroom office or den and an open with your patio as well. On the upper floor, you have a kitchen, living, dining, and balcony, and on the rooftop, the prefab vegetable garden and solar panels. The base unit can be incremented laterally and vertically, allowing for extra bedroom and or, and or living spaces. Here's a quick overview of this spatial organization, starting from the bottom, going up to the rooftop. Uh, since the 19th century, laneways have been bordered by spaces of poor architectural character. To transform this, we propose dwellings tightly networked to public spaces. Um, the bottom line is that we want to shift the feel of a back alley to that of a small village in the heart of the city. As for sustainable features, the housing unit is self-sufficient in regards to electricity by having four solar panels on the rooftop. A 10,000 liter basement cistern uh, stores rainwater that would feed toilets and hose bibs. Here's an overview of the project where you see a simulation of the laneway populated with housing units on both sides. We can also see the charred wood exterior finish, which uh, we use as it requires less maintenance than regular siding and is coated with non-toxic oil, offering a unique finish. The building structure is a cross-laminated timber post and beam system, a renewable material that generates almost no construction waste and allows for small crews to work efficiently. Here we see an overall view at street level, capturing the renewed vibrancy of the laneway. We also proposed suspended bridges to connect shared rooftop vegetable gardens. This would help access these areas even when vertical increments occurred. The network of vegetable gardens would then generate a sort of small urban farm that would improve air filtration, cool hot temperatures down during the summer, and provide healthier food, helping Toronto to be greener and more sustainable. 
So thank you for the opportunity to share some ideas about our project uh, in this uh, seminar. And I hope we can extend the conversation in a bit. Thank you very much, Anna and Isabella. Um, I love how you treated the laneway as a complex and not as just individual property lots. Um, but please wait for the q and I'm We're already getting some questions. Um, and next, I'm going to play the recording for uh, Giovanni from LA. Let me share the screen with you. Um, making sure. Hi. My name is Giovanni Portaldo. I'm the principal of the Law Practice located in Los Angeles, California. Here, we focus mostly on um, residential classes. I want to thank Smart Density for the invitation. We connected over our entry for the Toronto Affordable Housing Challenge. Our proposal was to build the heavy timber. These are drafted on the underutilized in between spaces of Toronto's urban landscape. Today, though, we will uh, present a small residential building that we're working on here in LA. The Los Angeles metropolitan area is a patchwork of 88 incorporated cities. with their specific and different development standards and instructions on how those standards are measured. Designers end up operating only in a handful of jurisdictions and projects become super local. Our project within the city of West Hollywood, which is on the west side of LA. The existing lot contains two single family homes, one story high, to be replaced by a 10 unit four story building. The need for housing, the density incentives, and the cost of real estate make projects like this possible. The city offers incentives if affordable units are provided. In this case, the base density for the zone would be five units, which become 10. The developer agrees to rent or sell one of the units as affordable for 55 years. On every project, the first thing that we do is to look at the urban plan. And here, as in many blocks in West Hollywood, there is a mix of duplex, multi-family courts, and large apartment building. The open space and gardens are often carved out of the mass of the buildings or after when the space of two courts face each other. Once we identified the marketable building envelope, we made the decision of pulling the building from the rear yard and place the required shared open space next to the setback. This creates a larger open area in between the buildings. We then divided the building mass into two portions to better relate to the scale of the neighborhood and part of the area. The carving is also applied to the outer corner for balconies and is highlighted with a different color. In this type of projects, the cost of construction pushes to maximize the rentable flow rate so that the project cancels out. This means that the work on the facade often becomes patterning on the facade. In the context of West Hollywood, the pattern of the facade can create an interesting play of shadows and depth. The same applies to the use of color that allowed us to avoid the general use of white, gray, and brown. So this is a view of the building on the street. An aerial view shows how the building steps back from the property line on the side. This is a view of the side elevation facing south, a view of the open space with the planted backyard. And on this side, facing the narrow setbacks, a pattern of aluminum profiles have to screen the open walkways that lead to the residential units. Again, another view of the front with the pedestrian entry sequence. Now quickly on the floor plans. To meet the zoning requirement, one level of subterranean parking is required which increases the cost of construction for a project of this size by about 20%. And it also discourages the use of public transit, which in LA has been improving over the past two decades, but still requires a lot of investment to get to an acceptable level of service. The subterranean garage also reduces the site permeability, which affects the recharging of the underground aquifer those few times that it rains. And finally, all multifamily projects in California need to provide the electrical vehicle charging station. 
The site is developed to exceed the required data score of permeability and give the unit private open spaces and provide a small community gathering space at the rear. As you can see on the floor plan, every unit has at least double exposure, which allows for cross ventilations and open walkways that eliminates the need to condition circulation spaces. The roof collects rainwater that is stored in planters at the ground floor and exceeds the minimum required areas for photovoltaic panels. Finally, the material palette is assorted in color and textures, and all the finishes have at least 30% recycled content. And this is a view of the building again on the street. Thank you. Thank you, Giovanni, for, <clears throat> for sending this recording. Next, we have jo Johanna Horn from uh, Winnipeg. Johanna? Hi there. Let me Hi. just see that I can get my... Yes. Um, screen to share here, just a second. Oops. Where is the play? Take your time. Yes, play. Uh, uh, no, I'm sorry. Having. There we go. Oh, perfect. Can you see that okay? Yeah, yeah, it looks good. All right, perfect. So um, I'm Johanna Herme. I'm a co founder of 546 Ar uh, 8796 Architecture here in Winnipeg. Um, also actively teaching across uh, Canada and the US. Um, and uh, latest uh, post as a Gen Gensler visiting critic at the Cornell University. Um, I'm also author of a couple of uh, things, uh, business case for compact city for innovative solutions for sustainable cities and platform middle housing for the 99%. Um, Winnipeg, of course, is, uh, uh, is centrally located in North America, center of North America, like we like to, to say. And um, We've been doing a lot of um, a lot of housing here since the beginning of our practice about 15 years ago. It does get extreme weather. Um, those of you who might not be familiar with Winnipeg, and uh, again, is is very much a sprawling city. Uh, lacks density is one of the least dense cities in the entire world. We have the um, the title of having the most um, most surface parking lots per capita in the in the entire world. So. What a dubious uh, record. I'm here to represent uh, 548 Stradbrook uh, project, um, again, uh, locally here in Winnipeg. Uh, the project is situated um, in one of the most dense uh, neighborhoods in Winnipeg. Again, doesn't mean much in the world scale, but, but good for us in a sense that um, this is a vibrant neighborhood um, that have, has a lot of mature houses and, and, and a good student and, and mixed population but also um, has a lot of uh, sort of uh, single family houses that are, are well protected by, by NIMBYist in the area. Um, so the site, uh, again, this project's been, it's been a while since we worked on this, um, I'm gonna say 2010 was, uh, was completed and, um, uh, and uh, it was a former frat house. And so uh, we fought with the city quite a bit uh, to turn it into an eight unit condo together with our developer. Um, at the time, uh, that was an unforeseen density on that, uh, you know, with regards to the other single family homes on the, in the area. Um, and uh, at that time to uh, the zoning regulation would, uh, would only allow conditional use of multifamily um, on the strip. And uh, with that uh, density of maximum of 800 square feet of lot area per dwelling, which the city um, zoning department or, or planning department did not allow us to do at the time. So it was quite a battle, uh, went through all the layers of, of a review at the, at the municipal level. It's a very simple project in a sense that we did finally get that through. Um, however, also parking requirement is one and a half cars per, per uh, suite, which we also went in a little bit of a battle to try to fight um, and finally got it down to the one to one ratio. And so we still in Winnipeg have the minimum uh, parking requirements. Um, so it really is, a, is a, um, an exercise in packing the suites as tight as we possibly could. Um, onto the, to the site respecting the zoning envelope that was given to us, maximum three stories, uh, four foot side yards, uh, 120 foot by 50 foot lot. Um, and the units range from uh, 1060 to about 790, I want to say. Um, 
And again, there's two on the on the main floor. So we have the first 101 entrance from the side yard, private patio to the street. Uh, next to it, the same thing repeats. Uh, then we go to the second floor. We have a similar suite up on the second floor uh, and one next to it, 202. Uh, one tucked in the pack facing the rear, um, unit uh, 203, and then um, unit 301 in the front, similar across the site. And then two two-story mezzanine uh, units, uh, three bedroom units uh, with the large roof rick on the, on the top. And again, very simple construction, just a uh, great beam on, on piles. Um, well, foundations aren't simple in Winnipeg anyway. We have to, we have to go with piles, even with the smallest houses here, uh, given the soil conditions on clay. But um, regardless, uh, wood, wood frame building, um, aside from the side yards that are too tight to build and have to be non-combustible, and so everything else is wood frame. And as with every other project, uh, we always assess them with, with statistics because we're really trying to carve a new kind of, uh, um, I guess, paradigm for what's acceptable housing for families through a life, lifetime and, and trying to convince people that they could live in less and in denser neighborhoods and so forth. So 47 units per acre. Our typical neighborhoods are five, uh, five per acre, the typical suburban uh, density. And again, varying from the just over a thousand to about 780 per square foot, um, three and two bedroom combo. And so given this packing and maximizing the zoning envelope, there wasn't a lot in terms of the massing leftover for us as architects to achieve or do. And really what we focused on uh, was, the, uh, was the system that you just saw going by there. Um, it's, a, it's a glass clip system. Uh, it was applied over a Vapro Shield, which is a um, UV stable membrane. Um, so actually not used as a sort of a, a transparent to see through, but we had that as a cladding material um, combined with um, punched, just standard punched windows and uh, stainless steel uh, surrounds on those. Um, small sort of uh, lightly dimensioned steel canopy for the side yards and the entrances into the suites as well as the front patio. And, and the idea here of course is that, you know, while we, uh, while we uh, invested all of uh, sort of massing energy just this in a simple box um it, it it there was not much of an architecture left and so the idea of this uh building is really to reflect the neighborhood and sort of be be disguised uh in its simplicity um, and the investment is really in the in the exterior um as a sort of a playful um front thank you thank you very much joanna um Okay, last but not least, Misha Bresniak, our Toronto representative and a smart density representative. <laughs> um, okay, Misha, take it from here. Hi, thank you, Nama. So I'm Misha from uh, Smart Density, uh, and I also happen to be Nama's partner. Uh, so I want to let me share the screen, of course. Um, Oh. Misha, it would be much better if you would speak directly to the mic. Yes. Um, okay, so uh, I so I want to share a concept that we uh, developed in um, in our firm, the mini mid rise, and um, so uh, let's start with uh, um, what it is. So the mid mini mid rise is a mid rise, uh, mid -rise uh, building on a single narrow lot, uh, generally on a main uh, street. So in Toronto and the GTA, we are ge generally talking about six to eleven stories, and your uh, commercial lot is usually between fifteen and uh, twenty-five feet. And the idea is that instead of your uh, typical uh, massive. Uh, a develop mid-rise or like high-rise development for that matter, uh, you get a small-scale incremental type of development, uh, what was very um, kind of the norm uh, in uh, traditional uh, cities or traditional types of development. And we, for this concept, we won the Ontario Association of Architects uh, shift competition, and we are working on a few of those in uh, different stages to 
uh, make it happen. Uh, now, I know like when architects present, we're expected to have a pretty picture. So we have one, but I really want to focus more on uh, the development aspects of it, because I think while obviously there are interesting architectural solutions in these things, it's mostly about how to make these things uh, happen in the real world. So I think the first question is, uh, why is it suddenly relevant? Why wasn't it done in the past? So there are three main aspects to it. Uh, one is that uh, finally in the really, really last, I don't know, one, two, three years, it's possible to approve small projects without parking in Toronto. Uh, and this is a critical component because for a narrow lot like this, you can provide at most one or two parking spaces, uh, so it would, you could never meet parking requirements uh, otherwise. Um, the second is uh, that... Um, it's, today it's much harder to find uh, development sites. Uh, land is much more expensive, and you know generally all the easiest to develop sites, your parking lot, your big box, are uh, either uh, developed already, already or in processes or reserved for uh, future development. And the other third aspect is that today people care uh, don't care as much about uh, your building amenities. And they do care much more about maintenance fees. So uh, the fact that you're in a small building and you don't have your gym, your pool, your concierge is not necessarily a negative anymore. And for many people, it's actually positive because the maintenance of the building is much smaller. So you're not really in that much of a disadvantage versus, uh, versus a large building. So... Uh, so why even do it? Why is, why is it a good uh, thing for development or in general? So uh, there are five uh, aspects, main aspects to it. The first is that um, uh, it doesn't require land assembly, and that's kind of the biggest uh, draw here. It doesn't require land assembly, so it's a much simpler uh, process. Uh, to buy, uh, you don't um, you don't have. Uh, uh, it, you don't uh, you don't go, go through like all the multiple uh, multiple landowners. You don't have one who thinks that their lot is critical for an assembly and will hold it out. Uh, so it's much simpler to acquire. The second is that the approval process is potentially at least simpler. And in our discussions with the city, there is definitely been willingness to move this project through committee of adjustment with site plan versus uh, through full uh, rezoning. So it makes it uh, cheaper, though not, not much, much uh, quicker. Uh, the other is that just because of the size of the project, it requires less capital. So it means there is a, a lower barrier to entry. So it's a good thing both for the developer, but I think it's also good for society and from the city's perspective that there are more participants in uh, development. Uh, the other is that uh, obviously it's impossible to provide the underground parking on a site like this, but it also means that you don't provide it. So it means the project is simpler and uh, you, you save that uh, cost. And from urban design perspective, um, by preserving this uh, the existing pattern of uh, narrow lots, it uh, it it really retains uh, a lot of the character of our main streets. Like the, the narrow lot pattern, in uh, my opinion, is more important than the uh, the specific height uh, there. And it's really um, and this is something that can really uh, uh, this is something that can retain it. And it's much harder to do in. Um, in larger projects, even if you uh, put that as a design intent. Uh, so that was a pretty rosy picture. And I want to discuss uh, the why not, as in uh, like a few reasons why it's uh, a little hard to achieve or some of the obstacles. So there are three main aspects uh, that we found while working on it. So the first of them is the low efficiency. So we have buildings with a relatively small floor plates, but we still need uh, two stairs and an elevator to meet the uh, Ontario building code. So you can never have stellar um, efficiency rate, like uh, some uh, mid-race buildings are able to achieve 88% for like your typical floor plate. Uh, it's not something that can ha happen here. Definitely, it's something we work on to improve and, and optimize, but it's, uh, it, it's just, um, it won't be the same as a much larger project. 
Uh, the other is the construction cost. So like higher construction costs are typical to smaller projects in general in the GTA at least. Uh, and uh, here you have two additional factors. One of them is that uh, the sites tend to be constrained. We have a uh, zero setback. We may, may have a laneway access, but it's not, uh, but it's usually not very, uh, not necessarily so convenient. So just in terms of construction staging and uh, it's, uh, it's hard to work on. And the other is that unlike your typical missing middle project that is a low rise, here we have to go through a non-combustible construction or to go with a more expensive type of wood framing. So that is also something that in, that's increasing cost. Um, and the last factor is um, land costs. So uh, I mentioned that there are more potential sites and they are more uh, easy to access. But one of the issues is that um, uh, while there are many sites, these kind of commercial lots in Toronto tend to be very well utilized. And if you have your two or uh, not to say three story commercial building uh, with a high coverage on a lot, it's very hard to justify replacing that by uh, maybe a six story building. It just, uh, you demolish the existing, you build it, everything in you. So it's really not, uh, it's not something that can be uh, uh, currently at least justified on any random uh, lot. So these are the main, um, kind of obstacles. So I just, I will wrap it up by saying that um, we think it's a very promising approach and we work again, we work on a few of those. Uh, there are challenges um, and we definitely hope to see, um, to see this kind of project, mini midrace projects materialize both, both in the city in general and from uh, uh, our firm in particular. So thank you. And I think I can stop uh, sharing. Thank you, Misha. Uh, I would like to kick off with a question for each of you, and then we'll go for the individual questions. But I think smaller properties or smaller projects, each of them introduces an interesting constraint. Uh, can you pick one from your, so one, I'm just picking it up from the questions. It could be stairs, it could be narrow lots, it could be access, it could be, so that, that you wouldn't face in a larger development. If you could uh, please choose one constraint that is unique to your project and how you overcome it uh, uh, creatively with design. Uh, Brian, which, can we start with you? Uh, sure. Um, I guess, uh, geez, there's so many, and I, I want to try to get out of the way of some of the ones I think others might say because they talked about it a little bit in their in their projects. But, I mean, to be honest, I mean, I think... I mean, an interesting tension I find, and I think that Misha was touching on this a little bit, is these small buildings that act like big buildings. There's a kind of sophistication of construction. And I remember our structural engineer struggled a little bit with getting this building to work. We actually have four steel moment frames in that, in that, in that building, uh, one on each end of the stair and one on each end of the building face. So I think um, I, this idea that... Uh, missing middle housing which for me is like fundamentally defined by by more affordability uh dialing in the kind of everyday contractor and engineer with a somewhat more sophisticated build that shades toward commercial meaning there might be some steel there might be some fabrication issues i i, I find that to be uh a challenge and so i think just to answer the question um you know, using getting smaller steel shops to to step up to a, a small moment frame rather than going to a big steel fabricator to do something small is important. All these little uh, sort of economic uh, you know levers are important. You know, framing, uh, figuring out how to get those mezzanine walls to work. You know, we we have like two by eight construction in those walls with a very particular wood species spec to deal with those tall spans. So. I think I, I can't really emphasize enough the kind of issue by issue, bit by bit, trying to economize all of the challenges of a building like this so that it doesn't end up being high in the sky, can't afford it, not replicable. Joanna, what, uh, what do you think of uh, the constraint and how design could solve it? 
again, I, I'm not sure that this is unique in this uh, this panel, but I think generally just uh, in our case, um, working in a mature neighborhood that's losing population and maintaining still massing wise sort of a similar scale so that um, there's perhaps less resistance and resistance, we all get resistance from change um, generally, but, um, but really turning a single family home to, uh, to eight units and increasing the density is something that we desperately need in our city uh, to make sense of the infrastructure costs and, and, and just delivery of day-to-day -day services. Um, we have an infrastructure deficit of over $7 billion in, in Winnipeg and nobody's really terribly interested in, in solving that at the fundamental level. And we've done calculations how we're actually able to fit all of our future growth for the next 25 years within the mature city. If we were just, you know, getting some support from a policy and political level uh, to do so, there are architectural solutions to, um, to achieve that without really compromising the character of the neighborhoods, in my opinion. I, we can definitely relate to that. Isabella and Anna? Hi. Um, I think our biggest uh, constraint was uh, the width of the lots that were varying average from five to eight meters. So that forced us to uh, uh, figure out a way uh, to work on the increment concept. So whenever the site was uh, would vary in width, we would grow sideways or vertically uh, to make it up for the whatever left space we had. So I think that was the biggest constraint. And I have a, I will have a follow up question. Uh, but Nisha, okay. you actually touched on, upon several of them, but maybe pick one and elaborate. Yeah, I think the main uh, the main constraint is that since we're operating on a, in a like main street con configuration with uh, uh, with a zero uh, zero watt uh, setback on the sides. Uh, uh, we have to. We're very limited in um, like daylighting, uh, so it's not it's not a problem that's unique to like the small uh, project, but generally to like mid-rise buildings. But um, because of the constraints of the site, uh, it's we, we might we might kind of end up with, for example, having. Uh, two relatively large units, but we can only make them one bedroom, even though the size could accommodate more. So this, we did look at um, interior uh, kind of court, small courtyards that introduced light, but uh, it, it obviously has its uh, costs in uh, efficiency and not always doable. So that was one uh, solution, but um, yeah, it's definitely, um, it's definitely an issue. Um, so for Isabella and Anna, I had a question. Actually, I can't find it right now, but the, I remember the question that how do you deal? So Toronto has different property ownership. And, and again, what, I, what stood up very clearly that you treated the laneway as a complex. How did you, wh what is the solution behind that uh, fact? Uh, I can answer, Anna. Um, the, Toronto approved the laneway zoning and laneway suite since 2018 adopted this official plan and zoning by law that permitted laneway suites in our zones or residential zones but there are rules that it depends on the size of the lot and the certain conditions but um, it, it's allowed to build a laneway suite um, in it it's a um, individual uh, project for the owner, but they can, um, together there are projects already in Toronto that a group of uh, owner, they decided to, together to create um, a, a kind of condo. It's important to remember that the laneway suite, it's a self-contained residential unit that is located on the same lot as a detached, same detached house, uh, townhouse, or other low house, um, low rise uh, rise house, and it's typically located in in the back of the the lot, but sometimes in the lateral size. But it it really depends on the agreement between uh, the owners. Um. Uh, Brian, we have a question for you. Here in Toronto, the building code, um, you, you basically need two staircase in, for each unit needs to have access to two staircase. 
Um, yeah. We got a question on that, but I wonder if if there's a, a different building code requirement, and if if it's not a different building code, uh, we you introduced a single staircase. Yeah. Um, well, so the international building code allows single stair buildings to access four units on floors two and three. Um, so it's you know most of the U.S. has adopted this code. There are individual jurisdictions which don't accept it um, although it's pretty common um, so you know excess house is actually four stories and i'll just clarify actually that building was built under ibc 2009 which allowed for the single stair building but also allowed for an interconnecting stair within the unit from floors three to four so you could have a bi level on top if the front door was at the third floor the new code does not allow that anymore um, which is interesting right i mean i think one of the things we thought a lot about with that change in the code is um uh you know how the code and once we get down to this like extreme affordability where like two stairs uh and an elevator as you as you step down from that there are some there are some advantages and um that uh there's a real intersection between the code and affordability um, and frankly, if I could just also mention Misha's comment about parking is a big deal because that's another thing that changed is um, actually Philadelphia's most onerous parking ratio is three for 10, which is actually very low, three spaces per 10 units. But when we did Excess House, the city was interpreting that ratio as only kicking in at the 10th unit. Um, and since then, they have now prorated it. So to Misha's point, if we did Excess House today, uh, we'd have to get a variance for parking. And the last comment I'll just make on that, which is really interesting, and I think I'm curious how the Canadian uh, vibe is on kind of community approvals for projects like this. But if Excess House had gone to the zoning variance board, as much as we sit around celebrating this project as like something great for cities, a lot of neighbors probably wouldn't be so happy about it. And so, the, I mean, Excess House was as of right by the zoning code. There was no community transparency around do we like this project so just to throw a little bit of a complicated wrench into the discussion there is that issue that i think uh is very real and um you know needs to be thought about you don't want to know what's going on here um <laughs> maybe, maybe maybe i'll just respond to that one last point uh so we are actually operate uh within a fr like we have a planning framework that uh on our uh, main streets which are called avenues uh you are allowed to do um to do like mid-rise buildings uh of certain height based on the width of the right of way uh, so the planning framework allows that it just it didn't really consider really uh, narrow implementations of that so uh, you still have to go through approvals process but it's not uh it's not like we're coming to a place that's uh that is destined to remain at uh, two stories and suggest um six stories in our case or uh, all of a sudden so uh it's actually it's not actually not such a huge hassle from uh, from uh, like approvals perspective in 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 this specific case um the question for um both joanna and john i know you i saw you already replied but maybe it could have an interesting discussion uh joanna and brian uh, could you both share the cost per buildable square foot uh, for your projects, um, yeah, I mentioned um, ours was one hundred and sixty-five dollars a square foot for Winnipeg. It's um, uh, one of the higher costs that we've done for the for the scale. We're usually in the region of one hundred and forty-five or so. And again, um, this was just because it's a lot of packing into uh, a small area, so it's very high in kitchens and bathrooms and the things that cost a lot. Uh, plus, we had a we have two exit stairs, of course, in there. And so um, it's a bit higher than that. And then for context, I was just saying that um, Winnipeg is typically about 20% in more in, in construction cost. Um, I think due mostly in, in small builds to mostly due to our foundations. Um, again, we have to pile everything uh, 30 feet minimum into the ground, um, even the smallest buildings. So that adds quite a bit. Usually 30% is spent on foundations um, of our building cost. Brian, anything you would like to share on? Uh... Um, yeah, I mean, I think that, um, you know, in U.S. dollars, we had a very similar per foot cost. Um, and I think, 
uh, same for us. Like when we're doing, when we're working on a more normative site, the cost can be lower, especially if it's a non-elevator building. Um, you know, and those steel frames, for example, and the two by eights in the walls are all things that drive costs a little higher to deal with the narrow level. But you'll notice like the climbing decisions we made on that building are very modest. And part of that is, you know, it's sort of like when you're trying to hit a kind of, uh, you know, affordability number, not formally, but just the idea that we're trying to keep construction costs down. Um, one of our challenges is always like what's left, uh, you know, to put on the building and, you know, you know, developers can be, can be pretty stingy about that. Yeah. And of course, having said all of that, um, I know certainly compared to Toronto, our land costs are so low that, um, you know, the, the cost of owning a home here is achievable for, for most families. I mean, and costs are going up, but not, not even close to the level of Toronto or Vancouver or near the coastal U.S. cities, certainly. And yeah. so we're still enjoying a great, a great lifestyle um, uh, here uh, in the center of the continent. Misha, I'm going to ask you two questions. Uh, first of all, how the stairs work within the mini mid rise, uh, narrow load constraint, and um, would you say that six stories is too much contrast with the neighbors? Uh, how about four or five, maybe? Or do the numbers affordability work only at six stories? Yeah, yeah, sure. So let's. Uh, I'll start with the stair. So generally, uh, for, for in our design so far, it we, we usually try to implement scissor stairs, which is the same uh, uh, kind of approach you would do in uh, like a high rise uh, building, just because it's the most cost efficient and works in a narrow configuration. But um, it depends a lot on the specific dimensions and circumstances of uh, uh, of the lot, but it's solvable. Uh, in terms of appropriate height, so, I, you know, the image I showed is intended to be a little provocative uh, because it doesn't show the plant context, but the reality is that the plant context is that uh, a, all, all these uh, streets, and th that was specifically on Dundas, um, so in that area you are allowed to go up to 20 meters uh, based on uh, uh, official plan and mid-rise guidelines, uh, six uh, stories in this case, other places are even higher. So uh, I think many of these places will be, uh, as they are already allowed to, will be redeveloped to higher densities. And uh, a lot of it is the question of, uh, uh, of the form. Will we see only redevelopment only in the form of like assembled uh, assembled site with uh, big mid-rise buildings or will it be also done by on a smaller scale same height but a smaller uh, scale thank you misha i'm just reviewing to see that if i missed any questions we we got a question which i'm i'm not sure even um how to solve it but the question of stairs within the unit, not, not necessarily about, uh, you know, elevator or, or any of that sort, but um, any comments on, on building tight, um, tight units that need to, to go up? Any thoughts there? Because I don't know what the question is. It's just a fact, I guess. Isabella or Anna, I think the, the, that question was uh, when you presented your project. So would you like to to speak to that. Anna, do you want to answer? You can go ahead. I was just looking that there's another question about and I think we are, you're a little bit, I don't know if it's just on my end. No, no, no we uh, we bad. also hear. Not yeah, you, yeah. You, Anna, you froze. Yeah, okay. Can, um, can you hear me? If I turn my camera, we off? can we can hear you. Yes, please go ahead. Can you can you please repeat the question, please? I, I my the, connection was breaking up. So yeah, the the question was. It, it, I'm sure I didn't position it as a question, more of you know to get your thoughts. But uh -huh. stairs within one unit, when you need to be, to build a tight unit and you build, you know, a unit that is for three or four stories, um, 
again, I, I, I couldn't find the question, but I, I remember that uh, that was a question. Any thoughts on, on that in terms of, you know, accessibility or, or being, you know, even family, I'm thinking of young kids need to go up uh, the stairs. But at the same time, this is a constraint that you're working with and building taller. So any thoughts on, on that? Um, I'm going to turn my camera back on. If, it, if I get cut off, you just tell me. I think we made a, uh, we had options to either uh, kind of occupy the ground floor more densely or give it away to the city to increase the width and more sort of habitability or uh, of the laneway. So by doing that, then we kind of shrank the, the house a little bit and we had to use the stairs to make it usable so that in order to make it accessible, fully accessible, I think we'd have to trade off the sort of uh, open patio, which answers the ne next question where parking could be. We, we left half of the ground floor is um, public and half is the access to the upper floor. So this way you increase the sort of urban space, if you will, of the laneway. So I guess it was uh, our, we went for that. And uh, I think in order to negotiate between these two things, we couldn't do that with uh, the, the, the public space. So we'd have to enclose the building fully and then allow more space for some sort of lift or something that would be, make it fully accessible because it's a very small footprint. Yeah, I, I, and I'm sure I, I respect it that it, it is a constraint, a common constraint, and sometimes you need more space and it, we need to go up. Uh, Misha, last question for you about the mini mid rise. Can the adjacent properties or the domino properties, uh, they, oh my God. I lost the question. No, I didn't. Okay. Can adjacent domino properties uh, incrementally share exit stairs? Um, I, I mean, in, in principle, it's only um, we, definitely not something we consider. Uh, it would be an interesting idea. Like on the simplest uh, terms, usually it would have to be developed uh, together to have that option. But uh, I can say through a not very simple, but process that nonetheless might be worth it. Maybe if you develop one property where you have the stairs uh, on the side and you uh, you develop the next properties, not as a standalone one, but as, some, uh, as having, um, let's call it an addition to that one relying on its exit stairs, that could be a very uh, interesting idea for sure. Thank you. And